The Senate will come to order. Senator Murphy. Good morning, Mr. President. I impose a call of the Senate. The Senate is now under call. Senator Murphy. I'll be right back.
Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and that the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, would you be so kind as to stand? In our tradition, we always start our day with prayer, and prayer by the chaplain today is Reverend Matthias Peterson Brandt from Cherokee Park United Church. And needless to say, following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Friends, it's good to be with you today. Will you please join with me in prayer? Creator God, as the Senate gathers today, we invite your holy wisdom into this space into the work of leading and governing. Ask your blessing on these senators elected to lead and to serve. Grant them clarity of vision to see the path forward. Grant them compassion for the work of listening to the people of Minnesota and tending the needs of the vulnerable. Grant courage for when decisions are difficult, when conviction wavers, when right action is costly. Grant flexibility, O oh God. Schedules shift, circumstances change, compromises must be made, life can be chaotic. Grant balance, for each person gathered in this chamber is a full human person made in your holy image. They have families and friends, hobbies and responsibilities beyond these walls. So may they work hard, and may they know moments of rest and grace. We pray this day for our state, for our nation, and for our world. I offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, and we pray in your many holy names. Amen. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Draskowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Frentz, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Coran, Kroon, Kunish, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, McQuaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Mohammed, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrom, Wickland, Jean. Members, a quorum is present. Members, pursuant to Rule 40.7, the following members intend to vote from a remote location. Senator Duckworth, Senator Dizik, and Senator Port. Members, consistent with our tradition, if you want to follow along, you can uh, look at the Senate agenda, which is dated Monday, April 8th. And we will begin at the second order of business, executive and official communications. The following communication was received. Please make note of it as no action is required. Members, we'll now proceed to the third order of business. Messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House files herewith transmitted. House file numbers 3071, 3436, 3454, 4024, 4176, and 4334. Signed. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, remember no action is required. We will now move to the fourth order of business, first reading of House bills. The House files have been given their first reading and referred as indicated. Senator Murphy. Mr. President, I move to lay House file 3454 on the table. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Are those opposed say no? 
The motion prevails. Members, we will now proceed to the fifth order of business, reports of co committees. Senator Murphy, for a motion to adopt the committee reports. Mr. President, I move the committee reports printed in the agenda and the addendum be adopted with the exception of the reports pertaining to Joint Rule 2.03 and the report pertaining to appointments. On that motion of the committee reports, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Murphy. Mr. President, I move that the committee report pertaining to the appointments be laid on the table. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, we will now proceed to the sixth order of business, which is the second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 4307, 4936, and 4745. The Senate files have been given their, their second reading. Members, we will now proceed to the eighth order of business, which is introduction and first reading of Senate bills. The bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members, there's one change. If you go to page four, and if you go to page four, you'll see Senate file number 5363, and that bill has been referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. As I mentioned, members, the bills listed on, on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> members will now proceed to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motion on the agenda and addendum as one motion. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, I will now call on some individual members for motion. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate file number 4125 be withdrawn from the Committee on Capital Investment and be re-referred to the Committee on Labor. Mr. President, this is my bill, and both of the chairs have agreed to this move. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble moves that Senate file number 4125 be withdrawn from the Committee on Capital Investments and re-referred to the Committee on Labor. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Rest. Um, I move that Senate file 4513 be withdrawn by the Committee on Labor and returned to its author. It's my bill. Thank you, Senator Rest. Senator Rest moves that Senate file number 4513 be withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and returned to its author. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 5128 be withdrawn from the Committee on Higher Education and re referred to the Committee on Education and Finance. This is my bill. I've spoken with the chairs. Thank you, Senator Umu Verbaden. Senator Umu Verbaden moves that Senate File Number 5128 be withdrawn from the Committee on Higher Education and re referred to the Committee on Education Finance. All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, if you notice, Senate Resolution Number 88 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. For your reference, there's no action that is required. Senator Murphy for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a recess to the call of the President. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now in recess. Members, we have a special presentation today. The presentation will start off with none other than S S Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I'd like you to, to draw your attention up to the gallery. Uh, we have Director General Lay from the Taiwan office based out of Chicago with us today, as well as a number of folks uh, from Minnesota who are originally from Taiwan. And we're here today uh, to reaffirm our relationship both economically and personally uh, with the folks of Taiwan. Uh, the one thing, members, I do, uh, before we get into the resolution, I want to uh, the folks from Taiwan to know that uh, Senator Champion, myself, Senator Hoffman, and everyone here uh, is keeping the people of Taiwan in their thoughts and prayers uh, as they recover from the earthquake uh, that hit Taiwan uh, recently. Um, 
Again, appreciate uh, Senator Champion and everything he has done to help coordinate uh, their being here today and having this resolution read. And so with that, uh, Mr. President, I would yield to Senator Hoffman. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, good Senator from Pine City. Reaffirming its commitment to strengthen and deepening the sister ties between the state of Minnesota and Taiwan, Mr. President and members, whereas in 1984, the state of Minnesota established a sister state relationship with Taiwan, and Minnesota and Taiwan have enjoyed strong bilateral trade, education, and cultural exchanges, and tourism, and whereas Taiwan shares the same values of freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, peace and prosperity with the United States and the state of Minnesota. And whereas the United States ranks as Taiwan's second largest trading partner, Taiwan is the ninth largest trading partner of the United States, and bilateral trade reached more than $160 billion in 2022. And whereas Taiwan imported $4.4 billion worth of United States farm products in 2021, making it the seventh largest market for United States agricultural products overall, the fourth largest market on a per capita basis among the top 10 United States agricultural export destinations, and the seventh largest market for the United States soybeans and corn. And Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. President. Whereas due to its high quality produce, the United States remains one of Taiwan's largest sources of agricultural pro products, supplying more than one fifth of the country's major agriculture imports. And whereas Taiwan and the state of Minnesota have enjoyed a long and mutually beneficial relationship with the prospect of future growth, and Taiwan was Minnesota's fourth largest export market in Asia in 2022, with $610 million worth of Minnesota goods exported to Taiwan. And whereas Taiwan provided more than 100,000 100, masks to Minnesota during the COVID-19 pand pandemic in a, gest in a gesture of goodwill to meet a global humanitarian need. And whereas Taiwan and whereas Minnesota-Taiwan bi bilateral economic relationship, it is essential to support Minnesota's businesses to enhance their economic engagement with Minnesota based on the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act. Article 14 of that act stipulates that wherever the law of the United States refer, refer, refer or relate to foreign countries, nations, states, governments, or similar entities, such terms shall include, uh, shall include and such laws shall apply with, prospect, with respect to Taiwan. It is legitimate for Minnesota business to refer to Taiwan as Taiwan in, in conducting their business with Taiwan. And whereas negotiations for bilateral trade agreements, the, ad, the avoidance of a double, a double taxation agreement, and the the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for, for, for Prosperity between Taiwan and the United States are an important step, uh, for, uh, are, are an step, important step toward further uh, strengthening bilateral trade between our countries, thereby increasing Minnesota's exports to Taiwan and increasing bilateral in investment and technical collaboration through, uh, through tariff reduction and other trade facilitation measures. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Continuing on, whereas Taiwan has undertaken a policy of steadfast diplomacy in its international relations, Taiwan is capable of and willing to fulfill its responsibilities and to collaborate with the world to deal with the challenges of humanitarian aid and disease control. And whereas during this year's Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Month, we celebrate Minnesota's vibrant Taiwanese American community that has enriched the state's culture, cuisine, and commerce for decades. And now therefore be it resolved by the Senate of the state of Minnesota that it reaffirms its commitment to strengthening and deepening the sister ties between the state of Minnesota and Taiwan. Senator Herr. Be it resolved that the Senate reaffirm its support for Taiwan Relations Act and encourage Minnesota businesses to refer to Taiwan as Taiwan. Be it further resolved that the Senate endorse Taiwan's effort to secure the signing of the bilateral trade agreement and avoidance of double taxation agreement and the Indo-Pacific economic framework 
for prosperity with the United States and reiterate its support for a closer, closer economic and trade partnership between the state of Minnesota and Taiwan. Be it further resolved that the Senate continue to support Taiwan's meaningful participation in the international organization, such as United Nations, the World Health Organization, ICAO, UN, FCCC, and Interpol, which impact the health, safety, and well-being of the people of Taiwan and support Taiwan's aspiration to make more contribution to the international society. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rare for final comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming our guests from the Office of Taiwan based out of Chicago and Director General Lei. Thank you, members. The Senate will come back to order. Members remaining under motions of resolution, Senator Murphy. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made special orders for immediate consideration. Member of the list, is, the members, the list is on your desk. Members, that is correct. The special orders list is on your desk, dated April 8th, 2024. We will start with Senate file number 3492. Senator Muhammad, this is a residential housing tenant and landlord provisions modifications bill. Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, before us is Senate file 3492, which will strengthen landlord-tenant relations and will increase housing security and stability in our state. Last year, we accomplished many hard-fought victories for tenants, and this year is no different. The housing landscape remains complex, leaving many tenants vulnerable. That's why it's important for us to, to pass this legislation, which will protect the tenants of our state. This bill establishes tenants' right to organize and ensures that tenants can organize their places of living around living conditions without fear of retaliation or displacement. This bill will provide tenants with fair options and opportunities to find new housing if the lease they signed violates, if the, if the lease they signed involves housing that is unfinished due to, due to construction or whatever other reasons. The bill will expand existing statute which prohibits landlords from restricting tenants' right to seek emergency assistance, especially in cases of mental health crisis, drug overdoses, or suicide attempts. This bill also requires, uh, requires landlords to accept individual taxpayer number, I-10, in lieu of social security number. It expands existing statute to strengthen protections for survivors of domestic violence in eviction cases and mandatory eviction expungement reforms for survivors of domestic violence. It also clarifies the right to counsel in public housing evictions is only in cases applying specifically to certain subsidized housing programs. Members, these provi the provisions in this bill have been heard in housing and in, in judiciary. And as this bill was moving through committees, we heard profound stories from impacted communities, folks who have been seeking these changes for a long time. We heard from domestic violence survivors, tenant organizers, folks who currently are unhoused because their living conditions were unsustainable. As lawmakers, it is, it, is it is so important that we do what we can to protect and uphold the dignity of our tenants. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I stand, Ms. Sen Senator, Mr. President, and I stand for questions. Any questions on Senate file 3492 or amendments? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A4 amendment. The Secretary will report the A4 amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend Senate file number 3492 as follows. Page 10, after line 24, insert. This is the A4 amendment. Senator Lucero, to your A4 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Muhammad. 
Uh, over the weekend here, we had an email exchange, and this is that amendment we spoke about. And for those uh, who are obviously want to know what the A4 does, Mr. President, in regards to one of the articles in the bill that deals with tenants' rights to organize and then organizations that would coordinate that, that gives them the right under this bill to contact those tenants. What this amendment does, it makes it abundantly clear that the landlord is not required to share contact information. As one who is strongly, obviously, in favor of data privacy and making sure that information is not shared with third parties, unauthorized, this makes that, again, clear. So, Mr. President, Senator Muhammad, this is the one, again, that we had discussed. Senator Muhammad, to the A4 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Um, and thank you for working with me on this amendment. I take it as a friendly amendment. Any other discussions on the A4 Lucero amendment? Any final words, Senator Lucero? Seeing none, all in favor of the A4 amendment adoption, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails and the A4 amendment is adopted. Any other amendments or discussion? Members, remember, we are on the 3494, Senate file number 3494. Senator Dreheim? Thank you. Um, Mr. President, will the author of the bill yield for some questions? Senator Muhammad, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, Senator Muhammad, for bringing this bill forward. We had a, a lively discussion in committee. Um, my, my questions, Mr. President, um, have to do with the tenant organizer portion of the bill. And I'm, I'm wondering, can a property manager or building owner require a background check for a tenant organizer? Senator Muhammad, to the, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Draham, for the question, no. And that's because um, housing uh, provide, um, tenant organizer organizations already do criminal background checks. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I, if, uh, will the author yield for another question? Senator Muhammad, will you yield for another question? She will, Senator Dreheim. If the tenant organizer, uh, Senator Muhammad, is not a resident, can the property manager or owner of the building do a background check? Senator Muhammad, to the question. No. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim. Will the author yield for another question? Senator Muhammad, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Dreheim. Will the landlord or the property owner or the property manager be responsible for any illegal activity or the actions of the tenant organizer? Senator Muhammad, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Durham, for the question. Um, this bill is, allows for tenants the ability for them to be able to organize in their places of living with other tenants. And they might be able to use um, tenant organizing uh, organizations who do this work. Um, and so when we talk about uh, somebody coming in and helping an individual who is struggling with the place they live in because um, either the heating doesn't work, a window is broken, they're helping them understand what their rights are. I don't think those individuals come in to create chaos and problems. So the answer is no. Senator Draham. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Senator Mohammed. But I don't think you answered the question. Um, you know, the, the bill does not talk about maintenance. It talks about having other people that don't live in the building come in to an apartment. And members, we just had a property manager 
get shot and killed. Yes, shot and killed in the metro. And now we're going to invite anybody in to a building under, potentially under, tenant organizing without the ability of the people whose job, who we require them to provide some kind of structure in an apartment so we can have quiet enjoyment of our homes. With that, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to offer the A6. Senator Dreheim offers the A6 amendment. The Secretary will report the A6 amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate file number 3492 as follows. Page 11 after line 9, insert. This is the A6 amendment. Senator Dreheim to your A6 amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, this just gives a property manager the opportunity to do a background check so they know who's coming in to the building. And they might request from the BCA a background check to make sure they're not a violent criminal. We have heard case after case, case excuse me, of sexual assaults, violence, domestics, and of course, the worst, the murders. So this amendment will be a tool for the property manager to use to make sure they're not letting in people with a criminal history. Um, please vote yes. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Muhammad to the A6 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator Draham, for the amendment. I will ask members to vote no. Um, one, because when a tenant organizer, uh, organizer is in the building, they have to be occupied by a resident. So these are not just individuals walking around um, without somebody occupying them. Um, the other reason is because criminal background check is already done on these individuals by the organizations that they are hired by. And when we think about it in terms of who landlords do criminal background checks on, on who, who do they not, um, utility workers come into, into buildings that we live in, are, are background, criminal background checks done on those folks? The answer is probably not. The answer is no, I would, I would say. And so I would ask members to vote no because criminal background check is already done on these individuals. Before we go to the author of the amendment, I want to see if there's any other discussion before we go to the author of the, the A6 amendment. Seeing then the last voice that you hear is from the author of the A6 amendment before we vote. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, would the author of the underlying bill yield for a question? Senator Muhammad, will you yield? She will yield. Uh, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Mohammed, um, you just mentioned that there is a background check done for the organization that will be organizing tenants. Um, I, I did not see a specific organization. Can you tell me the name of the organization that already does background checks um, so I can find it in the bill? Senator Mohammed, to the question. That's a good question. Um, thank you, Senator Draham. Um, I would say um, organizations that do um, these types of work are like organization, organizations like Equity in Place Coalition. They, um, they do criminal background checks on these organizers that they hire. Senator Draham. Thank There's you. Um, there is no named organization, Mr. President. We don't know if they're doing background checks because we don't know who the organization is. We need this comfort language, members. Please vote green. Members, we're on the A6 Amendment. The Secretary will take the roll on the A6 Amendment. Members, please vote.
Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Kunish, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Murph, uh, excuse me, Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. All members having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The A6 amendment is not adopted. Any additional uh, uh, amendments or discussion? The secretary will give the bill his third reading. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, you all. Senator Housley, I didn't see you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A5 amendment. Senator Housley offers the A5 amendment. The secretary will report the A5 amendment. Senator Housley moves to amend Senate file number 3492 as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert. This is the A5 amendment. Senator Housley to your A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, Senator Muhammad, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to talk to you about this earlier, but um, what the A5 amendment does, it, it's a delete all amendment, I'm sorry, but it adds back all of the provisions that we did talk about and we have bipartisan agreement um, through committee. Senate file 3748, 3587, 3979, and Senate file 3553, parts of it. Um, I'm just hoping, because there are some, some pieces of this which you've already heard from Senator Dreheim on the organizing piece. Uh, if we could just pass those that we have bipartisan agreement and then work on the rest of the provisions next year. And I ask for a green vote. Senator Muhammad to the A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Housley. Um, I wish you would have given this to me earlier on. There are part of this, parts of this that, looking over it quickly, um, that I like, but I'm happy to work with you as we move this bill through, um, through conference, and so I will not be accepting the amendment, but thank you for bringing it forward. Any other discussion on the A5 amendment before we go to the author of the A5 amendment? Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other discussions before I go to the author of the amendment? Senator Housley, any other discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the A5 amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Kunish, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. All, me all members having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 32 ayes and 35 noes. The A5 Housley Amendment is not adopted. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, I'd like to offer the A50 Amendment. Senator Westrom offers the A50 Amendment. The Secretary will report the A50 Amendment. Senator Westrom moves to amend Senate File Number 3492 as follows. Page 3, Line 18, before A, insert. This is the A50 Amendment. Senator Westrom to your A50 amendment. Uh, Mr. President, members, uh, the language in the bill is giving an alternative for an I-10 number if an uh, applicant is not willing or wanting to provide a social security number. Uh, this language in the A50 amendment would just clarify that a landlord or the person applying to use the I-10 number 
can also, should also provide that they have legal status here in the United States if they're choosing to use an I-10 instead of a Social Security number. Social Security numbers are much more uh, obvious that somebody has legal status to be here, and so uh, let's just make sure that's the, the case with an I-10 number and nobody's trying to skirt the system. So I'd urge your support. Mr. President, I'd ask for a roll call. Point of personal privilege. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Um, uh, for what purpose do you rise, Senator Latz? Uh, Mr. President, I'm really having trouble hearing the discussion here on the floor. I'd ask the President to indicate people who wish to talk about other issues that they maybe uh, either keep it down or move off the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, Senator Latz raises an important issue. We want to make sure that we're able to hear the debate on the floor. So if you want to have um, an extra extracurricular conversation or conversation in general, will you be so kind as to use the hallways or the retirement room? With that being stated, uh, Senator Muhammad to the A50 Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Westrom. I will be asking members to vote no on this amendment. There are um, many citizens who do not have social security numbers and use I-10, and so, um, and I, we don't ask anybody um, who, we don't ask people to prove whether they are a citizen or not just because they have an I-10. Any other discussions on the A-50 amendment before we go to the author of the amendment? Seeing none, the last voice that you hear is that of Senator Westrom, who is the author of the A-50 amendment. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, members, I just urge your support of the A-50 Amendment. Let's give uh, the parties involved the opportunity to know uh, the information they need as they're considering a rental application. Uh, we ask all employers uh, to do an e-verify to make sure that they are uh, hiring somebody that's here with legal status. Uh, this would be a very similar opportunity and requirement for landlords or property owners, uh, big or small, if they're filling out an I-10 number, uh, they should be able to have the same knowledge and uh, do the same due diligence as small businesses or large businesses as they do with an E-Verify system. This would be very similar to that. I urge your support. Members, we are on the A-50 Western Amendment. The Secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, um, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All members having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the A50 amendment is not adopted. Any other amendments? Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I uh, would move the A51 amendment. Senator Dreskowski offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the A51 amendment. Senator Draskowski moves to amend Senate file number 3492 as follows. Page 2 after line 14, insert. This is the A51 amendment. Senator Draskowski to your A51 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, members, um, we in this country and in our state uh, are experiencing the fallout from uh, the open borders that we have in this, in this country. We have people zooming into this country. We even have one individual uh, on video that is telling people how to squat in order to get access to housing uh, adversely from somebody who actually owns the housing. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this amendment uh, protects property rights, 
of the owners of property, protects the rule of law, and uh, brings us to a point here in Minnesota where we can feel confident that there is a remedy if people are squatting on someone else's property in order to take it away from them for whatever purposes they are seeking. So, uh, members, I encourage the, uh, your support of the A51 amendment. It uh, creates a request for removal uh, for someone who is squatting on someone else's property in order to take it away from them and has an application process that the individual homeowner uh, submits to the sheriff and then provides uh, the ability for the sheriff to remove somebody who is on someone else's property squatting uh, against uh, the law. So that's the amendment, Mr. President, I encourage your support. Thank you. Senator Muhammad to the A51 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll say that every time I walk in this building, on this chamber, every time I walk into committee, I think about the immense power that we hold as lawmakers and that our job is to do what we can to make people's lives better. Our job is to not make their lives harder. And I watch so many of our members speak about people as if they as if people are beneath them. I'll ask members to vote no on this amendment because I think to refer to humans as illegal is beneath us. It is beneath the seat that we hold. And I will ask Senator Jaskowski to apologize for speaking about this way, about people this way, just because they do not have a documentation does not make them lesser than you as a human being. So I will ask members to vote no. Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request a roll call, please. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Members, I'm gonna ask everyone gently that if we could just be mindful of our words, that would be helpful. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise in favor of the A51 amendment. We have seen stories recently across the country of homeowners going away to help family members who might be having some health problems, homeowners that travel away for vacation, homeowners that are away from their home for a number of days or weeks, to return and find that somebody has illegally entered their house, committed fraud, and claiming that they have a lease or some right to that property. And this is a huge concern. It's a phenomena that social media is grabbing or getting attention. And again, it's being reported across the country. It is costing homeowners thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to recover their rightful property, their private property that has been confiscated by somebody who is illegally squatting in their home. It should not cost homeowners thousands of dollars and months of time to recover their property. In one case, I recall, somebody returned home and the, the, the judge, I believe, I think it was a judge, did not want to remove the person over a holiday season because they would end up homeless, the person who had illegally entered the property. That left the homeowner themselves homeless. And so the reasoning is completely absurd. The reality is private property rights need to be upheld. And if somebody is committing fraud, somebody is confiscating another person's private property, they need to be removed without costing the legitimate homeowner thousands of dollars, weeks or months of time. Please, Mr. President, I encourage members to support this amendment. Thank you. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the United States of America is a nation of laws and rules, and as Senator Lucero just said, we can't be squatting in people's property. Nobody thinks that anybody's below them. We've worked very hard to get into our homes and raise families and make money for ourselves, and I believe everybody has that opportunity. You can come here and you can do that, but you cannot steal people's property. Thank you, Mr. President. We need to support 
uh, Senator, I forgot your name, Drzelski's amendment. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Letts. Uh, Mr. President, I agree that squatters ought to be removed when a landlord doesn't want them in there, but there already is a remedy in Minnesota law. Uh, the adverse possession law, in fact, there's uh, specific statutes that already deal with uh, uh, how to remove squatters through the eviction process. So this amendment is simply not necessary. I encourage a no vote. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, I, I couldn't disagree with one of my colleagues uh, more. Um, I, I think this does need to get addressed, and um, it, it doesn't matter who is squatting in a house, where they're from, if they're here legally or not here legally. Um, we have to protect property rights. And I personally have received calls from seniors worried about going on vacation and coming back for someone staying in their house. And the process that's currently in place takes months, Mr. President, months. So I applaud the E51 amendment and urge everybody to vote green. Thank you. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President, members. Yeah, I would just uh, kind of uh, piggyback on Senator Dreheim's comments. This isn't about immigration status. Uh, one way or the other. It's about property rights. We're talking about people who own a home or property and they've paid uh, the mortgage and they are gone for whatever reason and when they come back, regardless of immigration, we're just talking about squatters in general. Uh, and I just think we really need to reinforce that with the current uh, uh, behavior that's across the, uh, you know, the United States and I think we know there's going to be some concern here. So let's be preemptive. Let's stand up for property rights. We're not here to discuss immigration status. We're here to, to say squatting is, is wrong. We want to defend property rights of the people who own the property. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, members, I rise to urge your support of this amendment. Right is right and wrong is wrong. This amendment is about property rights. And do you think your constituents should have the right to own their property and not allow trespassers if they don't want them on their property? Or do you think the trespassers should have the rights and the per people that pay the mortgage, pay the taxes, pay the insurance, upkeep the property should be the bad people here? This is about as common sense as it should come. Squatting is illegal, it is wrong, and it's opposite of property rights, which is part of what our country was founded upon. The freedom to own your own property and do what you and your family want to have done with the property, not the government, not somebody across town or across the state, Last week, Fox News, ironically, Fox Channel 9 I'm referring to, if you go back to one of their morning newscasts uh, later last week, reporting about a fire in, I think it was Minneapolis or a suburb right around there, allegedly because squatters were in the building of somebody else's, and they started a fire. So now somebody that owns that property, because they weren't able to get the squatters out, or whatever reason the squatters got in there, started a fire and caused a whole lot more damage. Now that's what you're defending if you vote against this amendment. You really think that's what your constituents want? I think this should be a 100% passage. We should stand up for property rights. And for those that work so hard to own a property, keep up their property, and make sure we tell the people that are squatting, illegally trespassing, that's not going to be allowed in this state, and it's not allowed in our country. Members, any other um, uh, discussion on the 851 amendment before we go to the author of the amendment? Senator Letts. 
Mr. President, members, I've had an opportunity to read through the amendment. And what the amendment does is it says that a property owner has to meet certain requirements to be able to serve um, a, uh, a complaint here. They provide the complaint to the sheriff requesting the immediate removal. The sheriff then shall verify that the person submitting the complaint is the record owner of the real property or the authorized agent and appears otherwise entitled to relief. And then if verified, the sheriff shall, without delay, serve a notice to immediately vacate. So basically, you've got the sheriff acting as the, the judge in this case. This is not a complaint in a court. This is merely a proposed submission to the sheriff that any landlord could submit, sign it. The sheriff takes a look at it. If the sheriff thinks that what the landlord is saying is true, then the sheriff would immediately evict the person that is accused of being a squatter. Now, if, in fact, the person is a squatter and is not lawfully present, there's a reason why we have an eviction process in Minnesota that goes through the housing court. And yeah, it takes a little bit longer, but there are also ways to help prevent squatters from taking hold in a property. But what this does is it gives authoritarian control to the sheriff basically on the submission of a, of a complaint from a landlord, which they could use not only against squatters, but against any tenant that they don't want there anymore, a holdover tenant, so on like that, um, even when there are other provisions in the statute that cover some of those things, a landlord could submit this to a sheriff, sheriff says, yeah, that looks good, goes in and serves an eviction notice um, on the person. Absolutely no accountability, no controls, no oversight, not even a remedy that I can see. Um, I'm sorry, there is a wrongful removal provision uh, that's in here after the fact. Uh, the person harmed, so the person who gets forced out would be able to bring a claim against presumably uh, the sheriff. It doesn't say exactly. Uh, in other words, th this, even if one were sympathetic to the goals of the amendment, and I'm not going to stand here and defend people who are illegally trespassing and remaining on property, uh, but this is not the right process to go through. Absolutely not. There's a reason why we have housing court and procedural protections under our Constitution uh, for not only property owners, but property renters and tenants. And that law is already in existing statute. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I had no idea I'd be asking a question today on this topic, but would the Senator Latz yield for a question? Senator Lass, will you yield for a question? He will yield. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lass, um, I understand why this amendment is being brought forward. I think it's out of concern. I think I read about in New York um, where people have been required to, uh, where individuals have unauthorized, in an unauthorized manner, um, entered a home that was vacant um, and have settled in, and the courts have decided that not only do they not have to leave, that the uh, landlord can't even turn off the power or change the locks. Um, and that's what's on the mind here, and many people talk about this, and they're a little worried. Uh, Senator Latz, can you tell me that in Minnesota, if somebody would enter the property in an unauthorized manner, uh, and uh, the, the owner found out about it, um, is there, uh, how is the law in Minnesota governing such a thing that in, in New York uh, seems to have been a disaster? Senator Lass, to the question. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Abler, I don't know New York laws or why that was the case, but in Minnesota, a landlord brings an eviction action, and that's already well spelled out in Minnesota statute. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I don't know New York's laws either. I bet they have eviction laws there as well. Uh, I just want to point at something to your attention since I actually began to read the amendment. Oh, no, now I lost it. Um, oh, rats. Oh, phooey. Um, anyway, um, shoot. Um, don't ask me to help you with your technology, Mr. President. Um, it talks about uh, that the person uh, entered without an agreement. It talks about that this, this person never had a rental agreement. 
And <clears throat> your, your explanation of what it does and doesn't do relative to the sheriff having power over any tenant is totally erroneous. Um, items like one and four um, in that list, if I can find it uh, in the amendment. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> I just touched my computer and it went blank. Um, so, uh, Mr. President and Senator Latz, on line 1.9, uh, it says, this individual is not just any old individual, but it's a person who has unlawfully entered and remained or continues to reside on the owner's property without authorization. This is not a person who has not paid rent. And then item number four, it says the unauthorized person is not a current or former tenant that had an agreement. So, uh, Senator Latz, I have a feeling that New York thought about some of these uh, laws, and I bet they have eviction laws there as well. I can tell you there's a lot of people in my area who are afraid what might happen given how things are going, uh, especially in a, a blue state like ours, fearful that they will actually lose control of their home. So members, I urge you to vote yes, and Senator Lance, you're free to react if you want. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Oh, uh, Senator Lance. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Abler, I would simply say that despite the fact that there are some criteria in the statute that Senator Abler just pointed out, there is no accountability uh, or oversight for the sheriff in what level of due diligence they would do before going in and physically arresting a person and removing them from the property. That's the biggest concern about this amendment, is putting all that power in the hands of the sheriff for an immediate removal. Senator Lucero, now. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to add why it is appropriate for the sheriff and not appropriate for housing court as a remedy to deal with this situation. A squatter is somebody who has illegally trespassed and broken into a home. This is not a housing court issue. Housing court, as Senator Abler just pointed out, deals with somebody who has had a lease, is a, uh, a current tenant. Housing court, in my direct personal experience, can take months. In one example, it took me four and a half months to evict a tenant. Under laws that were passed last year by the Democrat trifecta, they have elongated that process, making it even more cumbersome and more difficult for a lawful private property owner to evict somebody who has illegally or overstayed their welcome. That is the reason why housing court is not the appropriate remedy. It is not and should not take a homeowner months to recover their property. This is a trespass issue. Squatting is a trespassing issue that should be dealt with by the sheriff to bring immediate relief. Just as the sheriff would respond to a trespass call and immediately enforce the law. That is what is seeking to happen here under the A51 amendment. Bring immediate relief by having the sheriff enforce the law because this is a trespass issue. Please, Mr. President and members, I encourage a green vote to uphold private property rights of law-abiding citizens across the state of Minnesota. Members, before we go to the author of the A51 amendment, I want to make sure that everyone has had an opportunity to speak who desires to speak on the A51 amendment. Anyone else before I go to the author of the amendment, of the amendment because that will be the last voice you'll hear before we vote on the A51 amendment. Seeing none, Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, interesting discussion, Mr. President. Um, and members, Minnesota isn't ready to accept the far left's woke approach to redefining what is going on in our culture to the point of giving up their house. And that's what I'm hearing from the Democrats here in the discussion here, Mr. President, this morning, is a denial of the fact, initially, Senator Mohammed suggested that uh, we shouldn't, we should turn a blind eye to the fact that somebody who enters our country illegal, illegally violates federal law 
immediately upon doing so. It's a federal misdemeanor to do so, Madam, uh, Mr. President and members. The discussion about the property rights of our homeowners across Minnesota, of our property owners, this is core to what is the meaning of owning property in our state. And Senator Latz, our tenant landlord laws don't cover what happens to homeowners when somebody climbs into their property when they're gone for a week or a month or whatever and takes control of it and, and begins the process of stealing their property. That's what, Scott, that's what squatters do is they're, they're in the process, Mr. President, of stealing the deeded property from Minnesota homeowners. So, Mr. President, members, a vote for this amendment is to protect the property rights of homeowners in Minnesota against squatters who want to take away their property from them. And a, and a vote against it is one that turns a blind eye to this and will allow it to continue to happen in the state of Minnesota. I encourage your support, Ms. members, and thank you, Mr. President. The secretary would take the roll on the Draskowski A51 amendment. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Kunis, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. And Senator Port votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The A51 amendment is not adopted. Any other amendments? The secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 3492, a bill for an act relating to housing, amending provisions relating to residential housing leases. Third reading. Any final comments on Senate file 3492? before we go to the author, who will be the last voice that you will hear. Seeing none, Senator Muhammad, final comments. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Um, first, I want to thank people who helped work on this bill, um, the organizers who brought many of these provisions forward who are in the gallery. Thank you for your work on this. I want to thank Will Freeman, our researcher of the committee, and the tremendous work that he's done in Davin. Um, Chair Poor and all the members who are in our committee who brought, for, who brought um, bills forward that are a part of this package. Um, of course, my legislative aide, Ben, and Senator Latz for his work um, to get this through judiciary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, last year, we really did incredible work for our tenants. Um, but when we look at Tenants and, tenants and landlords and the power imbalance. We have so much more work to do. And um, every time I seem to think, every time I walk in here and I present a bill, I have members in this body who can't understand if their job is to be a lawmaker or an ICE officer, or if they're a federal lawmaker. Our job is to create state laws that help our citizens here in our state and everybody who lives in the state. And so this is a good bill. It is a common sense bill. It is a bill that everybody has been a part of. Please vote green. The secretary would take the roll on final passage as amended to 3492. <laughs> Members, please vote.
Senator Kunish, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Port votes yes. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 37 ayes and 29 noes, the, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now go to House File 3613, Senator Dibble for Metro Mobility Funding Forecast Clarification Bill. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to present House File 3613. Uh, members, if you're wanting to follow along on the language that, uh, we, that is before us, uh, we have the unofficial committee engrossment um, that we are working on. Um, and that's available up at the, up at the table there, uh, if you need the paper copy. Uh, Mr. President, members, very quickly, uh, the legislature in 2021 required that Metro Mobility uh, which is, everyone may know, the uh, paratransit, the special transportation services uh, that we provide in the metropolitan area on an on-demand basis to people with mobility disabilities, um, has become a forecast program for the, starting with the federal, with the fiscal year 26-27 biennium. And so what that means, uh, members, is that the state would be required to pay from general fund the annual net cost to the Met Council to operate Metro Mobility uh, and understand and have an understanding of the difference between the actual costs from the prior year and the forecasted costs. And of course, that would be minus or less the funding that comes from non-state sources. Uh, members, uh, this bill uh, serves to clarify that the annual financial review submitted by the Met Council to the legislature in conjunction with the ne November and February forecasts uh, rely on the forecast adjustments determined by Minnesota Management and Budget in consultation with the Met Council. Uh, so it makes the forecasting retroactive to July 1st of 2023 uh, and the November 2023 forecast effective date for the annual financial review effective beginning with the November 2024 forecast. I hope that's clear. Um, so uh, very quickly, uh, members, what we're doing is a little bit of fix-up and catch-up. Uh, in fact, Metro Mobility uh, had already become a forecasted service, and, and those forecasted costs were built into the November, November and February uh, forecasts. Uh, and we are also just making sure that we're not reaching back prior to the date uh, in which the, the service became a forecasted service. Um, the fact that the dates weren't quite right was recognized uh, and a chair's letter was submitted to Minnesota Management and Budget, hence the November, November and February forecasts were correct. And so this uh, just makes sure that the reading in our law specifically conforms to the intent and the practice. Uh, and then, Mr. President, um, this bill, if you recall, had been on the floor, was sent back to finance so it could pick up another fix that was necessary in the realm of education, which Senator Kunish will explain. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, this also includes a technical adjustment to the fiscal year 24-25 appropriation to reflect our per-pupil student counts based on the February forecast from the end of last session. Um, the bill was passed by the Senate on March 21st, but we did not specify an effective date. So MDE cannot make those reimbursement payments to school districts for school meals without this appropriation change. And so this bill indicates, um, includes an immediate effective date applicable to this provision. Members, we're on House File 3613, the unofficial engrossment. Any other discussion? Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, members, uh, to use uh, Chair Dibble's 
description of the bill, I want to talk about fix-up and catch-up, and not the ketchup that you put on your hamburger or hot dogs, but Metro Mobility, the fix-up and catch-up that's needed. It's time to fix Metro Mobility so it actually works for the, visitor, for the riders that need it, and it's time to catch up with the times so we don't continue in the same rut that Metro Mobility has offered for years and decades. Some of you probably don't have a very good understanding about what Metro Mobility does and serves and how it operates. And some of the reason you don't is because you're lucky. You don't have to use that as a source of transportation. But for those with a disability, those that have to use it, or it's their best option, it's not a great option. And so we're here to fix the forecast and the expenditures of it. But members, I want to bring our attention to the need to take this money and use it better, more efficiently, so the riders that need Metro Mobility could have a better service a faster service, and I would submit to you, in many cases, a cheaper service. Uh, ten plus years ago, I worked with many disability groups to try to implement what they call the taxi ticket. Before the dynamic style of Uber or Lyft or other uh, platforms that we now are experiencing and have a, have a much greater uh, network in our Twin Cities and even cities across the rest of Minnesota. Rural cities even have networks of Uber and Lyft. And many people with disabilities are ambulatory, so they don't always need a van that has a wheelchair lift. But Metro Mobility generally runs around with buses that are sometimes more expensive to drive, wheelchair lifts, for those that need them. But if you're a customer using Metro Mobility, I hope you don't have a very busy schedule because you won't make most of your appointments. So it's fine if you've got one appointment to make at 10 and another at 2 in the afternoon. Never mind if you've got a job to get to. But members, Metro Mobility, if you haven't had the luxury of knowing how it works, Count yourself lucky, but dig into it a little bit more with your constituents that do. Because one of the things they require is that you give them a half hour around your appointment. So if you have a 10 o'clock appointment, you better have them pick you up at 8 in the morning. Because you have to give them a half hour to pick up your ride, you as, as the rider, and then you have to give them another hour and a half to drop you off. So now your 10 o'clock appointment has you leaving home at 8 o'clock. Let's say your appointment has an hour. So your 10 o'clock appointment that takes an hour will give you two hours on the front end, one hour for the appointment, and two hours on the back end. So now anybody with a disability needing Metro Mobility service has to block out from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock of their day just for their ability to get transit to their appointment. Now how many of you would like to work with that kind of a system? Why don't you just try it for a week and see how much you can get done in a week? That's the current Metro Mobility System members. So I raise and take this opportunity. I know Chair Dibble is quite interested in it. There's a report, an audit coming out in the next week or two, likely. Members, let's take it to heart. There is a much better dynamic system we could incorporate in with Metro Mobility. Let's tear down the turf battles, the turf wars that go on, and. I refer to that, the taxi ticket that we tried to get in. We did implement some years ago, but 
If the parties that are trying to implement it really aren't interested in doing it, the bureaucrats can make it fail if they want. We now have Uber, Lyft, and other dynamic platforms that can help be part of the system that can revolutionize. So let's fix up Metro Mobility and catch up. Let's catch up with the times, use the technology and the opportunities and the network that now exists in our state, not just in the Metro, but across rural Minnesota. And let's give those that need paratransit a much more dynamic and user-friendly system. And members, it doesn't have to blow the budget. We can offer people some assistance to subsidize their more dynamic ride. That's what the taxi ticket did. Some of the money we're putting into Metro Mobility would go towards paying part of that taxi fare, but those riders would be able to get to their appointments much quicker and return home or return to work much quicker and not have to dedicate over half of their day just to get to one appointment, which is what the current system requires. So, Mr. President, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk about this. Members, I thought it's a good time to highlight the need to fix up and catch up Metro Mobility, as the Chair indicated. Those were appropriate words. And Mr. President, members, I know we can do better. I look forward to continuing to work on an improved Metro Mobility system, both for the Metro area and across rural counties, where we can take the dollars currently we're spending, revolutionize it, and I believe earnestly provide a much better system for those that we're trying to help. Members, we are on House File 3613. If there are no further amendments, I will go to third reading. Anyone else before I go to third reading? Seeing none, the secretary will give House File 3613 its third reading. House file number 3613, a bill for an act relating to technical corrections, providing for clarifications on forecasted Metro Mobility funding. Third reading. Any other discussion on House File 3613 before we go to the author of the bill? Anyone else before I go to the author of the bill? Seeing none, Senator Dibble for your final comments for House File 3613 before we vote. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I support, uh, I appreciate any support for this bill that members can provide. I just also wanted to acknowledge uh, Senator Westrom and the comments that he made about Metro Mobility uh, and, um, and call members' attention to the report that he referenced, which will be coming out from the Legislative Auditor in a week or two, um, to please read that report uh, and take it to heart. Uh, we are going to hear that report in the Senate Transportation Committee, and it will inform uh, what we do on behalf of those who need uh, mobility services like Metro Mobility, uh, as well as those kinds of services that people might need to get to their lives all across the state. It's very, very important um, that we do this better than we are doing today. So I appreciate Senator Westrom and the comments that he's made. Thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage of House File 3613. Members, please vote. Senator Kunis, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye.
All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 55 ayes and 12 noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members will now go to House File 3437, Senator Westland for a Memorial Bridge designation. Thank you, Mr. President and members. The bill we have before us today is a bill to designate the bridge on Highway 169 and Rockford Road, which spans Plymouth and New Hope, and rename that bridge the Michael Gow Memorial Bridge. Mr. Gow was a dedicated and beloved MnDOT employee. He lived his values and cared deeply about his community and his state. And he worked with the Department of Transportation for 14 years while also serving as a Bell Plaine firefighter for 23 years. And he was their firefighter of the year in 2021. Okay. Senator Ress. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, on behalf of the uh, residents of New Hope, I'm one of them, and um, our mayor, Kathy Hempkin, and our city council, we also are appreciative of the, um, the work that Mr. Gow did and, um, and want to acknowledge that. Um, and not only his work on that bridge, but his long record of public service, um, uh, also impressive. And the mark that he made left uh, on the lives of those lucky enough to have known him. With us today, uh, joining, um, joining us, Senator Westland and I would like to acknowledge Jennifer Gow and her daughter, um, uh, page in the gallery, as well as MnDOT workers and Bell Plain firefighters. Their presence serves as a testament to the, line, the kind of co-worker, husband, and father that Mr. Gal was. Mr. Gal's life was tragically cut short on August 30th, 2023, while working on the site of this bridge. Memorializing him through this bridge is a worthy way to celebrate his legacy and will serve as a reminder that we should all live our lives as truly as did Mr. Gow. Um, Mr. President and members, Senator Weston and I appreciate your support for this bill and a green vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Wessler and Senator Rest, for bringing this forward. As many of you know, Belle Plaine is, is right next to where I live. It's uh, right in the heart of Scott County. And Mr. Gow was everything you said. He was a tremendous firefighter. We don't want to forget. He was a devoted father, grandfather, husband. And we, in Scott County, still have a tremendous closeness around our communities. And when you find someone with the character and the local leadership that Mr. Gow had and his unwavering devotion to that community, um, it's truly special, and, and we are all heartbroken by the accident that happened, and I think it's wholly appropriate we name this bridge and, and uh, allow MnDOT to cover the cost of these signs in that he was working on behalf of the state. It's not unusual from what I hear that his attention was often to what he could do for other people, not what he could do for himself. And so, Mr. President, I, I urge all members to vote in the affirmative on this bill. Any other discussion on House File 3437 before we give the bill its third reading? Seeing none, the Secretary will give House File 3437 its third reading. House File number 3437, a bill for an act relating to transportation, designating the Michael Gow Memorial Bridge over U.S. Highway 169. Third reading. Any other discussion on House File 3437 before we vote? 
Seeing none, the secretary will, will take the roll on final passage of House File 3437. Members, please vote. Senator Kunish, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting pursuant to Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and two noes, House File 3437 is passed and is title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to House File 4483, Senator Limmer, which is for legislative enactments of miscellaneous technical corrections and redundancies and conflicting and superseding provisions. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. I think you already made the presentation on my bill. Um, for those who don't know it, uh, I'm presenting the celebrated 2024 Revisers Bill. And uh, as many of you know, this bill corrects technical errors, generally in statute and laws. It corrects erroneous and incomplete cross-references and internal references. Oftentimes, it uh, has to supply the correct, updated, and complete provision. And sometimes it, it uh, corrects typographical or grammatical corrections. The bill is approximately 120 pages long. And I'll begin by reading page one. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, I'll stand for questions, Madam Chair, or Madam President. Um, Senator Lance. Uh, Madam President, uh, I don't have a question for Senator Limmer. I stand in support of the bill because it's so celebrated. Uh, immediately following session today in Senator Limmer's office, that we'll find coffee, cake, balloons, and filet mignon. <laughs> it's a good bill. Vote green. Is there further discussion on House File 4483? Seeing none. The secretary will give House File 4483 its third reading. House File number 4483, a bill for an act relating to legislative enactments, making miscellaneous technical corrections to laws and statutes. Further discussion on House File 4483, Senator Limmer. Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on House File 4483.
Senator Kunish. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All members having voted, there being uh, 66 ayes and one no, House File 4483 is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on special orders is Senate File 4027, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to present to this body Senate File 4027. Uh, members, there are four sections of this bill comprised of these Senate files that were all heard in committee. All right. yeah. Senate File 4027, my bill, which was originally just one small policy provision, but we did a delete all to wrap all six small policy provisions that were in inadvertently split up by the revisor's office when they were intended to be in one bill from D. So we made that change in committee on March 6. The language has not changed. However, we obviously amended additional language from three other bills that were heard in committee. Members that you'll, uh, you will notice in Senate File 4027, uh, language from uh, Senator Putnam's Senate File 4925. And this includes an amendment incorporated from Senator Nelson from committee. Uh, and addresses four small business programs at D, the emergency, the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program. The second program is the Small Business Assistant Partnership Program. Number three is the Community Wealth Building Program. And last but certainly not least in that area is the Expanding Opportunities Growth Loan Fund. After that, we had the language from Senate File 4172 from Senator French. This is just a federal, a federal conformity language, and we believe it is not uh, uh, controversial. And thank you to Senator Friends uh, for bringing this forward. And if you have any questions about that, Senator Friends will certainly be available. And last but certainly not least, we have language from Senate File 3756 from Senator Hochschild, which simply raises the cap from 5 million to 10 million on lines 23.9, 24.11, and 24.3. 30 of this bill. We also increased the cap from 5 million to 12 million on lines 25.9. This increase will certainly uh, help local communities afford uh, their, their ability to take on water treatment projects that the uh, agency distributes grants to help them complete. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, there was a repealer that, uh, where that repeal language was integrated in the rest of the bill. So they just reorganized that section so that we can make sure that it's reader friendly. And so we did not remove those important guiding factors uh, that deed uh, makes sense of. Last but certainly not least, there was some discussions about an administrative fee where D testified that there were um, smaller grants uh, that were a little problematic to just do 5% and they wanted the discretion to do a little more when it came to small grants, not larger grants, because they understand and they testified to that the biggest thing that they want to do is make sure that we get money in the hands of Minnesotans and not necessarily um, uh, paying large amounts for administrative fees. So that's the bill. Um, and I think it's a good bill that will help improve things for Minnesotans. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or amendments. Thank you, Madam President. Discussion on Senate File 4027. Senator Draheim. Thank you, uh, President Russ, Rest. Excuse me. I would like to offer the A9 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate file number 4027 as follows. Page three, delete section two and insert. This is the A9 amendment. Senator Dreheim. 
Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Champion, for bringing this bill forward and all your hard work in the Jobs Committee this year. Um, I, I do appreciate it. Um, you know, I think we all want to make sure everybody has a career-type job and is on that pathway if they're not already in a career-type job. And, and to do that, we need resources, Madam President. And, um, you know, in, in the past, we've really looked at the cost of running programs. So what the E9 does, members, it puts that cap back in so the grantee can't spend more than 10% of the grant on administrative expense. Um, so pretty simple amendment, members. I urge a green vote. Discussion on the A9 amendment. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you so much, Senator Dreheim. Members, I am going to ask for a roll call vote, number one. Number two, I'm asking you uh, to, uh, to not support the Dreheim Amendment. We had a robust discussion about those caps, and Dee was very clear as to uh, why those caps um, and the change was necessary. We know that DEED is a uh, quality organization. They take it very, take very seriously the work that they need to do on behalf of Minnesotans. And we would ask that, um, um, that we continue to support the recommendation of DEED because it is a reasonable and thoughtful recommendation. Thank you so much. Members, there will be a roll call on the A-9 amendment. Further discussion of the A-9 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Members, when we grant organizations monies, we expect them to use it for the purpose that we intended. They come to us and if they ask us for $10,000, we expect them to be able to use $10,000. Now, I've always looked at how much we pay in administrative costs when we do these grants. And as Senator Dreheim said, we had those capped at 10 percent. With inflation, as the cost of services go up, the cost of the request goes up, and the amount that the department is receiving automatically goes up. But removing this cap now creates a conundrum for us in that as we want monies to go to getting Minnesotans back to work, we continue to fund functions in the Department of Employment and Economic Development that they should already be doing, that they're already staffed for. In many of these cases, we are not hiring or retaining anyone with these administrative costs. Now we do fund a number of uh, positions through our federal program, but, but fewer through these state administrative grants. And it's fiscal responsibility upon our part to make sure that these monies go where we intend them to go. This should not be a supplemental agency funding bill, this is a protection to make sure that when we put our approval on a grant going out, that as much of that money goes to the intended recipients for the intended purpose, not to continue to fund an agency. Senator Dreheim, thank you for bringing such a reasonable amendment, and members, I encourage you to vote yes. Is there further discussion of the A-9 amendment? Senator Champion, did you want to comment? Just reminded the body to vote no. Uh, just, just for clarity, the administrative costs are all controlled. Uh, Deed testified to why the smaller grants, uh, a little discretion would be helpful, but they understand th that it's important to get money back into the hands of Minnesotans, and that is being fiscally responsible because it's being very thoughtful on behalf of Minnesotans. So thank you so very much, and I ask that you vote no. The Secretary will take the roll on the A-9 amendment.
Senator Kunesh, for those voting un remotely under Rule 40.7. Madam President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. And Senator Fateh votes no. And Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Ms. Or Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All members having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion on Senate File 4027. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was just reviewing the bill, and if Senator Champion would yield for a vote or a question. <laughs> Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. Yeah, in reviewing the bill, you know, we don't have a cap on there, which was just defeated. Second thing I noticed in Article 3, we're eliminating a detailed estimate along with necessary supporting evidence of the total development cost for the public infrastructure and eligible project. Then we go on to say a timeline, in, we're also eliminating a timeline indicating the milestones of the public infrastructure of the eligible project. And then thirdly, we're eliminating a commitment for the governing of body to repay the grant if the milestones are not realized by the completion date uh, on the timeline. Uh, members, that, that would be, those three would be 10.22, 10.23, 11.1, 11.2, and 11.4. 4 and 11.5. I'm just wondering, Senator Ch Champion, why are we li eliminating some of this accountability to the government in terms of how taxpayer dollars are spent? If Senator Champion would respond. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Gr Grunhagen, this particular bill is all about accountability, even when we think in terms of caps and if, if they're guiding principles around factors is all geared towards how do we make sure that we are delivering the services and opportunities to Minnesotans. So when Dee came in and talked about the changes or the proposed changes that were necessary, they were doing it from a thoughtful perspective. Uh, and they were doing it because they are, are known to be an agency of thoughtfulness and concern about protecting Minnesotans and our taxpayer dollars. So uh, any limitation that you've seen or cap change is a reflection of what Minnesotans have said and articulated that is needed. So, so thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Grunhagen. <coughs> oh, thank you for that response, Senator Champion. But members, I mean, we're just eliminating some of the accountability of our of Minnesota taxpayers on projects where they get grants and we know less about how the money's being spent and not more. And one of the things I've figured out with government, where government money shows up, the price of everything goes up, and there's a great potential for waste, fraud, and abuse. So I don't see why we want to take out these provisions, all three of them, where we find out exactly, where the state of Minnesota finds out exactly where the money's spent and also some of the consequences for not getting the project done uh, when, it, when it's supposed to be. And for those reasons, members, I'm going to have to uh, urge a red vote. Thank you, Madam President. Further discussion on Senate File 4027. Senator Draheim. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, members, we, we uh, heard in, in the author's opening remarks that I, I believe in uh, what is it, subsection or subdivision five um, on page 11, that that was being rearranged and put into different spots. And I, and I think uh, my colleague um, just kind of touched on that, how we're removing some things. And I know there's some language that's been rearranged, but in that section on page 11, that repealer, 
uh, where it pretty much deletes subdivision five, the whole intent of that members, of that whole section was to provide the state of Minnesota the highest return for its investment. It's all about priorities. Highest return in the public's best interest. If you read th that, it says priorities. If applicants for grants exceed the available appropriations, grants must be made for public infrastructure that in the commissioner's judgment provides the highest return in public benefits for the public incurred. Sounds pretty important to me, Madam President. It goes on to talk about prioritizing transportation. Public transportation, Madam President. That should be a priority. Efficient use of existing infrastructure. Providing affordable housing. Crime reduction. Blight reduction. I think everybody in this room would support that. And I'm really concerned why we're deleting that section. So I would like to offer the A10 amendment, Madam President. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate file number 4027 as follows. Page 11, delete section 3. This is the A10 amendment. Senator Dreheim, if you will, explain your amendment. Thank you, Madam President. Um, members, it just reinstates those priorities. It's our responsibility as elected officials to be thoughtful, just like the author of the underlying bill said, that deed is, and I do believe deed is very thoughtful. But this comfort language was put in by previous members of this body for a reason. And to me, it's common sense. Pretty simple amendment. Please support the A-10. Thank you. Madam President, discussion on the um, uh, A-10 amendment, Senator Champion first. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. I am going to request a roll call first. And secondly, I'm going to ask the members to not support the A-10 amendment. Members, what Senator Dreheim is talking about was discussed robustly in our committee. And in fact, the, uh, 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 this came from a number of community members who said that uh, some of the information was unclear and therefore it needed to be reorganized. So everything that's in the repealer is, all, is already reorganized in the bill. This was communicated to Senator Dreheim along with a number of us, not one time, but at least twice. And we even, and if you look at page 10 of the bill that you'll see some of those um, additives are directly from the repealers because those things have been uh, reorganized in the bill itself. Because there are things that are priorities. We all agree that they're priorities. No one is disagreeing saying that they are not a priority, but they're in the bill and the bill is reorganized. So the bill simply provides more clarity. And again, this, this didn't come from the agency. This also came from community members who uh, 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 indicated to the, the agency that clarification was needed. And so our bill reflects what the community needs and wants and the clarification needed. So I would ask that you uh, uh, vote no on the A-10 Dreheim Amendment. There will be a roll call on the A-10 Amendment. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Um, and I appreciate uh, the discussion. I appreciate the amendment and also the clarity by Senator Champion. I'm going to mention three things that are being repealed that bring me great concern. And I would think they would uh, bring great concern to all. And uh, specifically, I'm going to ask Senator Champion to verify that these three important uh, requirements actually are reorganized. I thought it was a little bit... Um, 
not as clear as I would have liked to have heard in committee about what was being repealed and what wasn't. So Madam Chair and members, uh, these are the three things that I think are concerning if they're not in the um, reorganized language. The first is um, a detailed estimate along with necessary supporting evidence of the total development costs for the public infrastructure and eligible project. I think that's important to know. I want to make sure uh, that that is in the reorganized language. Secondly, a timeline indicating the major milestones of the public infrastructure and the eligible project and, that, and the anticipated completion dates. That's important information. I want to make sure that is still in the bill, uh, in the uh, law. It's just in a reorganized position. And then probably the most important one that causes me the greatest concern is what appears to be a repeal, hopefully it's reinstated somewhere else, of the commitment from the governing body to repay the grant if the milestones are not realized by the completion date identified in the timeline above. Members, I think those are all three important protections that need to be in the reorganized language. So with that, Madam Chair, if I could ask Senator Champion to yield. Senator Champion, will you yield for a question? He yields. Senator uh, Nelson. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Champion, um, I listed those three areas uh, particularly, and are you able to address each one of those three, and if they are um, included in the reorganized language and where that might be. Senator Thank you. Champion. Madam President, uh, Senator Nelson, thank you so much for your questions. And again, members, I'd just like to confirm that everything that you're hearing on the floor was already discussed in our committee. And in fact, the two members who are putting forth these amendments were a part of those robust discussions. In fact, Senator Nelson was a part of the discussion when uh, Deed confirmed that these uh, notions were reorganized. But I'll attempt to uh, take care of, of each one of them in the uh, method provided. So number one is that in the event that an individual does not meet the, the requirements of what's been articulated with Deed, they can't get the grant because it is a reimbursable system. It is not a system that just says, okay, you're going to get $50,000 and then Deed just allows someone to back their, 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 their truck up to Deed and now they get $50,000. So it's not that. It's a reimbursable model, first of all. Secondly, uh, Senator Nelson, uh, hopefully this will help answer your questions again. If you look at on page 10, it, it modified the language and said a resolution certifying that the money required to be supplied by the local government unit to complete uh, the public infrastructure project is available and committed and the commissioner must evaluate complete application for eligible projects using the criteria. And the criteria from that um, repealer talks about that the project is eligible is an eligible project as defined under subdivision two, so it has to be eligible, and there's a number of things that are looked at. If you look at, and that is on line um, 10.21, then if you look at 10.22 to 10.25, uh, it talks about the, about the project is expected to result in or will attract substantial public and private capital investments and provide substantial economic benefit to the county or city in which the project will be located. That's the return on the investment that absolutely those things must be there. Then if you look at lines uh, 10.27 all the way to 10.31, it talks about the project is not relocating substantially the same operation from one location to another unless the commissioner determines the project cannot reasonably be accommodated within the county or city in which the business is currently located. I think those are the things of, uh, 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 that you wanted me to verify and, and that there's a timeline infrastructure. Uh, let's see. Especially if you also look at line 11.2 to 11.3, it talks about there being also an expectation that is going to generate jobs, return on investment. 
Uh, those are some of the things that I believe that you wanted me to repeat on the floor here. But members, I reassure you that there's nothing that is being done in this bill that is not about returning the investment, making sure the criteria is clear, and making sure that the members of the public get the support that they need in order to do everything that the Jobs and Economic Development Committee uh, has been um, 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 commissioned in order to make sure happens when, when we think in terms of deed and the other players. So thank you, uh, Senator Nelson. Vote no on the uh, A-10 amendment. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, you did answer uh, most of my questions. I think it's important that all members, uh, even those who are not on the Jobs Committee, are able to see that these protections uh, remain. So uh, that is the end of my questioning on this particular amendment. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Draheim. Thank you, Madam President. Um, members, uh, thanks for the discussion on the A-10. Um, you know, I, I, I want to point out to members, this is a pretty short bill. It's only 26 pages. And, and on the back page, it shows the repealers. So what, what I was reading before, on, on page 11, I think line 11, it talks about repealing section 5 there, or subsection 5. So on the last page, it lists priorities. And that's guidance that this body gives to the agency so they can make those tough decisions on what to fund. And we've been told, we were told in committee, and we were just told right now that this language is rearranged. It's in a different part of this short bill, only 26 pages. And for us members, that is not very long. Madam President, will the author of the underlying bill yield for some questions? <clears throat> uh, Senator Champion, do you yield? He yields. Senator Draheim. Thank you. When, when we look on that priorities paragraph on the back page of this bill, on the second sentence, it ends with highest, and then the line three, return, in public benefit for the public cost incurred. Madam President, could the underlying author find that in the bill? Where, where do they rearrange that, Madam President? Senator Champion. Madam President, Senator Dreheim, thank you for that question. Senator Dreheim, uh, members, I think it's important for you to know that the guiding principles from that repealer are reorganized in this bill. And in fact, what Deed and the others testified to, as well as community members, is that some of the language was slightly changed just because of the fact it didn't provide the level of clarity that it needed to be provided. Um, Senator Dreheim, if you look at page 10, you also see on page 10 where it talked about the, the project is expected to result in or retract substantial public and private capital investment and provide substantial economic benefit to the county or city in which the project will be located. You asked about earlier, which was a really good question about return on investment. What will the impact be? And so there's a number of guiding principles and members, just so you also know, that what the agency does is that they outline a contract with whoever is getting the grant where there are certain goals and, and outcomes that an agency or organization must, must adhere to. So even though there's these guidance here, the contracts also will fulfill this notion as well. So Senator Dreheim, we've discussed this in committee. Thank you for uh, uh, bringing it up because we all care about return on investment, economic vitality, job creation, those are all the things that have been um, uh, reorganized in the bill. And not word for word, but the guiding principle in order to make sure it's clear because the public talked about how confusing the uh, repealer was. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Vote no on the A-10 amendment. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, would the author of the underlying bill yield for another question? Senator Champion, he yields. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Senator Champion, for, for that answer. I, I cannot find the language. I, I would respectfully disagree with your response, but let's, let's ask another one. On the next sentence, it talks about public benefits, 
including job creation, environmental benefit to not only the state and the region, but also efficient use of public transportation, efficient use of existing infrastructure, and then affordable housing. So, Madam President, Senator Champion, can you show me where they prioritize public transportation, existing infrastructure, or affordable housing in this bill? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Senator Dreheim, as I mentioned earlier, and I don't mind repeating, um, one of the things that the agency wanted to do, along with the community members, was to clarify some of the language that, uh, that's in the repealer. And one of the things that they wanted to do is make sure that it wasn't just narrowly focused, but that it was broad enough so, so that there could be a cross-section of things that could be talked about and included, right? And so they used the word like project. And you'll see that on line 10.25, where it says benefit to the, account, the county or city in which the project will be located. So whether it's housing project, whether it's transportation focus, wh whatever it is, there's still the guiding principles that the, that the agency and the others will have to look at in order to make sure that it was eligible. And if it's eligible, then in the contract or in the agreement, there would be uh, measurements and metrics and all the other things that are important along with making sure we're not just moving one project uh, 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 to another uh, place of space and, 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 and it being defined as substantially the same operation from one location to another location. We want to make sure that there's a return. If you're getting something, what's the return? We don't just want you moving a peg from point A to point B. What's the benefit? And so, Senator um, Dreheim, Madam President, I hope that answers this question because it's not just housing, it's not just transportation, it's projects and, and other things that are necessary in order to move our great state forward. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, uh, Senator Champion, for, for your response. But once again, members, the answer is no, it is not found within this bill. So my last question was going to be, Madam President, to find the crime reduction or blight reduction, but I think we all know that we're not going to find it within the bill. I've checked. It's not in there. So my amendment, the E-10, just puts this stuff back in. And to say that they needed a broader guidance to fund projects, the highest return in public benefit. That sounds pretty common sense to me and pretty easy to argue pretty much anything on that. Um, public transportation, how much money do we spend? We just had a bill on public transportation. Existing infrastructure, pretty broad. Affordable housing, obviously a passion of mine, but then crime reduction and blight reduction? Who does not support that? So if you don't support public housing or affordable housing or transportation or fighting crime or blight reduction, then vote with Senator Champion. If you do support those things and do think it's important for your community, then vote green on the A-10. Thank you. Further discussion of the A-10 amendment, Senator Champion? There being no further discussion, there's been a roll call. The uh, secretary will take the roll.
Senator Kunesh, for those voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Fateh votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. And Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All members having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Further discussion of Senate File 4027. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam President. I have the A11 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Nelson moves to amend Senate File Number 4027 as follows. Page 3, after line 11, insert. This is the A11 amendment. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, members, the A11 is an amendment that I'm hoping we all can get behind and vote for. It is intended to help prevent fraud. Now, um, it is modeled after the HHS language that was signed last year in the omnibus bill, which actually uh, is the exact language that I'm seeking here to put into the jobs bill. And you might think, well, why do we have to be concerned about fraud? Well, members, uh, let our memories not be so short. Uh, we do need to be concerned about fraud. In fact, I was shocked to read that the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, a global group, at the end of the year, they list the five worst cases of fraud. And members, I am sorry to see that Minnesota was on that list. Thank goodness we weren't number one, but we were in the top five. I think this is something we all should be concerned about. This particular article was about the $250 million of feeding our futures fraud. Uh, those of us who have been here for a while will remember the $9.5 million in Medicaid fraud. This is Minnesota, folks. Um, and then we, will, we must not forget the $162 million in the payroll protection program. Those are just a few that easily come up. It need not happen again, members. I encourage a supporting the A11 amendment. As I said, it is the language that has already been signed into law in the HHS omnibus bill last year. What it does, members, is any grants to the workforce development uh, over $500,000, there must, in a new grant program, not existing, but new grant programs, uh, there must be a, col a collaboration between the deed commissioner, a giving a list of uh, measurements that we should measure by to MMB. They come up with that measurement list, uh, those metrics. If you want to know how you're doing, you got to have some metrics, folks. Um, and then, of course, there's the reporting requirements for those same grants over 500000 including a summary of how the funds were used and including looking at how those uh, measurements um, were um, were uh, followed. So members, this is a good government bill. I can see no reason why we would not want our jobs bill to the, have the same type of fraud protection when it comes to grants that we put into the HHS bill last year. I encourage a green vote. Further discussion of the A11 amendment, Senator Champion. Madam President, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for your A11 amendment. The first thing I'd like to do is ask for a roll call. And, and the other thing that I'd like to say to the members here, members, this particular amendment was brought before the committee already. 
We had a robust discussion about it along with Deed and the others. And we dissect this A11 amendment to show that it creates more of a problem than solves anything. In fact, number one, that we are clear about, Deed has always been known as a very responsible agency that has all the protections and frameworks in place already. What also is unfortunate about the A11 amendment is it, number one, it doesn't prevent any fraud. Deed already has in place a mechanism to, pre to prevent fraud. Members, I'm going to remind you again, because I talked about this earlier today, is that if a, a, a contract or an agreement is going to be agreed upon with Deed because someone meets the criteria, there's a contract with, with metrics, things that a, 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 an organization must do before they get any money because it is a reimbursable model. What that means, members, is I have to do the work first. Based on the contract that has been put forward, I have to do the work first. I have to show them that I did the work. And if it meets the criteria, it is only then is my invoice re, um, uh, um, um, honored. But if not, there's nothing. So it's a reimbursable model that has been proven to work. Here's what this also does. It, it confuses not only just deed, because it involves now another state agency, MMB. So now you want another state agency to be engaged and involved in something that deed has been doing a really good job of up to this particular point. Deed has been heralded as an organization that isn't ripe for fraud and those other things, because we're all concerned about that, and we want to make sure that we're all doing what we need to do. And in fact, there's nothing in the A11 that says, if there's a disagreement between the commissioner of MMB and Deed, what happens? So even though there's a dollar figure, if you look at lines 1.5 to 1.6, before issuing any economic development or workforce development grant of $500 or more, Deed says, no, we take this serious and don't give anybody any, any money, no matter what the dollar amount is. If it's $15, Deed says, what's the contract, what's the measurements, and you do it first, and then we reimburse you. So members, I just ask that you understand that metrics and contracts are already in place, oversight and, 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 and making sure that we avoid fraud is already in place regardless of the amount of money. And it's for those reasons, and I'm sorry for taking so long, because I did uh, uh, request a roll call, but I don't see it listed on the board. I did request a roll call, and I would like the members to vote red. Thank you so very much. There will be a roll call. Further discussion of the A11 amendment, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Well, members, I do believe this is a good amendment. It is a good government amendment. And I don't sense that um, it causes any of the concerns or issues that are the uh, chair of the Jobs Committee mentioned. Um, I, I do urge uh, for a green vote, Madam Chair. I appreciate the roll call. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, thank you, Senator Nelson, for bringing the A11. I rise in support of the A11. Members, last year we gave over a billion dollars to public entities. A billion dollars of our residents' tax dollars. It wasn't our money. It's their money. And they entrust us to give good priorities spend our money wisely, invest in the future. And we just had, in, in my short time here, multiple fraud cases, multiple fraud cases that made national news. And here is a common sense amendment that one of the other agencies in our state adopted, and we're getting pushback. A billion dollars. And I, and I wonder, of the two biggest fraud cases we've had in recent years, the daycare fraud and then the feeding uh, futures fraud, if 
this would have helped. And I didn't get elected not to come up here and try to find solutions. And I applaud Senator Nelson for bringing this forward. It does not hurt. It will not affect the agency to have some checks and balances on here. All day, all we've heard is it's not what the agency wants. It's not up to the agency. It's up to us. People elect us to come up here and make those tough decisions. Support the A11. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, the uh, secretary will take the roll. Senator Kunesh, for those voting remotely under Rule 40.7. Madam President, uh, Senator Fate votes no. Senator Fate votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. And Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. All members have been voted. The secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Further discussion of Senate File 4027. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, members. You know, since, since we had the pandemic and Governor Walls shut down our economy and we had a record number of people filing for unemployment. We took our unemployment trust fund, as you, as you may recall from 2022, we started off with a $1.7 billion reserve. We drained that and actually owed the federal government a billion and a half dollars. And we paid that off to prevent an additional tax on our small business community. And, we're, and as I said, we're still 10,000 jobs short of where we were pre-COVID. Members, um, what you also may recall in that discussion is that there's a special assessment that's put on that unemployment trust fund premium. And that goes to the uh, uh, Workforce Development Fund it's allocated to the Job Skills Partnership, which runs our dislocated worker program. And it helps people who go through layoffs to then cover the expense or, or get the training they need to get a new job. Members, as I talk to business owners across the state, they are struggling to find qualified applicants. And it's made them rethink how they recruit, and what they have to provide. What I hear from a lot of the businesses in my community, Madam President, is that they are having to take on a large portion of that training expense on their own. So they're paying into the Workforce Development Fund to provide job skills training, but for the job skills training that they're providing, they don't get any recognition of those monies that they're paying in. Now, this was an amendment that I brought in committee, and I appreciate uh, Senator Champion. He, uh, he had a number of uh, concerns and recommendations, 
And so, Madam President, I would like to offer the A-12 amendment, which I hope Senator Champion will recognize as slightly different from what we discussed in committee. The Secretary will report the A-12 amendment. Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt moves to amend Senate file number 4027 as follows. Page 3 after line 11, insert. This is the A-12 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam President. Members, what the A-12 does is recognize that employers, particularly those employers with 100 or fewer employees, are taking on a huge burden of training, their, of training people to be able to do the jobs that they're being paid for and to do it proficiently. It also recognizes that in many cases we have to upskill those employees as technology changes or as, as the, the business demands and the market demands change. And so this allows an employer to request half of their workforce development surcharge back as a credit to the next year's special assessment. So members, this will ensure that we're recognizing employers are having to train their own employees. And it also protects the Workforce Development Fund from being uh, overused and going into deficit to make sure we still have enough money for the Job Skills Partnership and the Dislocated Worker Program. There is nothing like this in our current state law that provides this reimbursement back to employers. And let's understand, we want workforce development funds to go to workforce development. And that's exactly what this will do. And Madam President, I would be happy to stand for questions. Further discussion of the A-12 Amendment, Senator Champion. Madam President and Senator Pratt, thank you so much for the amendment that you brought forward. The first thing I'd like to request is a roll call, There'll Madam be a roll President. Call. And Madam President, uh, uh, Senator Pratt was correct that uh, he had presented this uh, proposal in front of the committee, and I did try to articulate as, as, as um, thoughtfully as possible why uh, his proposal uh, would not work. The first thing I want the body to know is that employers currently have available to them through the Minnesota Job Skills Partnership grants opportunities to be reimbursed already for any training or development that they do with their employees. It's already available to them. They can do it right now. They've been doing it. What Senator Pratt is attempting to do is to, uh, is to muddy up the process by saying that someone should be able to do it and then they should get half of their special assessments or up to half of their special assessments. They can use that to offset. It would be very difficult to, to monitor that process. But members, do not be confused. Employers have available to them already money and grants for any development that they do with their employees already. So members, those grants are, are available. Employers have access to those resources no matter where they uh, work all across our state. In fact, we're one Minnesota. We really try to make sure that resources are available for all of our employers. And if they're struggling, um, we don't want them to struggle that's why we have this grant and pool of resources already available to them that they can apply for and receive. So I would ask you vote no and vote red on the A-12 Pratt Amendment. Thank you. Senator Draheim. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you, uh, Senator Pratt, for bringing the A-12 forward. I, I rise in support of this amendment. Um, <laughs> you know, it's designed after reading it and hearing it in committee, um, for small employers, small employers. And we just heard it's difficult to monitor, difficult to monitor, kind of counters everything of the last couple of amendments we had, Madam President. Um, we don't want any checks and balances. 
for nonprofits or for government, but there's not enough checks and balances in this amendment um, for small businesses. I, 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 it's, it's funny. It, I'm sorry. I, I have to say that. Um, you know, members, this goes after just people trying to make a living to upskill current employees by people they're working with every day. And it would lead to increased salaries, more opportunities, and that career path of job that we're all fighting for. We all want everybody to be successful, Madam President. We want everybody's career to advance. Um, I, I think this is a very creative way of doing it at a very minimal cost to the state. It was mentioned that there's already programs available. They just have to apply. Not all small businesses have the resources to apply for a government grant. I would venture in this room, there's very few that would take the time or know how to even start that process. So with that, I urge a green vote and support the A12. Thank you. Further discussion of the A12 amendment. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam President. Uh, members, I ha heard Senator Champion's concerns when we were in committee, which was why this amendment is slightly different than it was when we were in committee. And let me explain some of those differences. First off, originally we were looking at a reimbursement. This is, a, this is to be a credit on what's assessed. Senator Champion talked about businesses could apply for grants. Well, let's understand that, members, because currently we have an incumbent worker training program where business can get grants for that training, but they have to be entered into Workforce One, and they have to be determined to be at risk for laying someone else, for laying someone off. The second piece, as I talked to Deed last week, was that the other grant programs require a partnership with a higher education institution. And not all of this training requires that partnership. It can be done internally. It may not come out with any new certification, but it's vitally important for someone to be able to do their job, either as an incoming worker or as someone who's been there and needs to be retrained on some new equipment. You know, in my district, we have a lot of, a, a, a lot of different industries. We have hospitality, we have healthcare, we have advanced manufacturing. All require very specialized training that is transferable, but vitally important. What this does is it streamlines and eases that, that uh, tax credit and requires reporting back to us to make sure that we are not draining the Workforce Development Fund. Because we want that fund available to be able to hand or, handle mass layoffs. So members, while Senator Champion says that we already have programs to do this, he's right in certain circumstances. But we do not have a program that recognizes the ongoing training, our small business community, those with a hundred and fewer employees, our smallest of employers, are taking on. Madam President, this is a very reasonable bill and one that will help foster job growth in our state. And I urge a vote in the affirmative. Further discussion of the A-12 amendment, seeing none, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the secretary will take the roll.
Senator Kunesh, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Madam President, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. Senator Fate votes no. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Lemmer, do you intend to vote? All members having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Is there further discussion of Senate file? Whatever it is. You took the number down. 4027. Seeing none, the secretary will give Senate file 4027 its third reading. Senate file number 4027, a bill for an act relating to economic development, making policy and technical changes to programs under the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Third reading. Further discussion. Is there further discussion of Senate file 4027? Seeing none, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you uh, to the members for a robust discussion. I just, just briefly, I want to thank Vice Chair Senator Muhammad, Ranking Members uh, Senator Draheim, uh, Senator Gustafson, Senator Herr, Senator Housley, Senator Nelson, Senator Pratt, and Senator Putnam. Executive Assistant uh, to the President, Shamika Bogan, um, my Committee Administrator, Tom Melton, uh, my Committee Legislative Assistant, uh, um, uh, Alexis Varner, Senate Counsel Carlin Doe Fontaine, Senate Fiscal Analyst Hannah Grunwald Noder, uh, Danny Gillis, our caucus researcher, Jack Vince, who has been filling in as, uh, oh, while Danny is out, as he just had a new baby, so we're congratulating him if he's listening. Andy Larson, the GOP researcher for our committee, and Ben Petty, Senator Muhammad's LA, who helps us run Zoom in our committee. Our interns, Ava Roots, of course, Stockard, and our pages, Kylan Johnson and Will Olson. Members, I hope that you will vote in support of this particular bill. I always believe there's room for improvement on every bill, and I'll continue to have robust discussions with members and others, uh, but I think that we have a good bill here, and I ask that you vote green. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll on final passage. Senator Kunesh, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Fate votes aye. Senator Fate votes aye. Senator Jasensky. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. All the senators having voted, the Senate secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 29 nays, 
The bill is passed and its title agreed to. order of business announcements of Senate interest. Uh, without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Limmer from 12.05 to 12.15 p.m. Any other announcements of Senate um, interest? I'll start over here. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, Sunday, the University of South Carolina defeated the University of Iowa in the Women's Basketball National Championship game. One of South Carolina team members is Jess Tessa Johnson, who scored her career-high 19 points, leading her team to help clinch the incredible victory. Madam President, Tessa is a 2023 graduate of St. Michael Albertville High School, STMA, one of the great school districts I have the privilege of representing here in the Minnesota Senate. While at T STMA, Tessa made the Minnesota State Tournament three out of her four years. In her senior year, Tessa was named Miss Basketball as well as McDonald's All-American. Tessa isn't just a leader on her team, she is a leader in developing the next generation of basketball players. She volunteered with younger basketball teams, attending their games and practice and providing mentorship to the players. With three more years to play at the collegiate level ahead of her, I trust we will see many inspiring performances from Tessa. Not only is Tessa a very skilled basketball player, but an amazing human. She is kind, a hard worker, dedicated, and a great teammate with outstanding character values. Tessa is the real deal both on and off the court. We in the Minnesota Senate recognize the great performance of this Minnesota superstar. Congratulations again, Tessa. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Madam President. Members, the Senate Energy Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee will meet at 2 p.m. Senator Latz. Madam President, the Judiciary Committee will meet 15 minutes following adjournment. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, from Senator Champion and Senator Hoffman and myself, I want to thank the members uh, for the reception that we gave to uh, the Taiwan uh, office and their delegation from their Chicago office. And uh, co-chair and I, uh, Senator Hoffman, would like to encourage members, uh, if they wish to join the Taiwan Friendship Caucus, uh, please reach out to one of us. Uh, we will get you on that, and then we will share that information with uh, the Taiwanese delegation so that they know uh, which members uh, to reach out to in any time they're coming toward to Minnesota. And we would love to have a little get-together at some point in the near future with the members who join the, dele uh, the caucus. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Members, uh, for those who are part of the Jobs Committee, uh, we are not meeting today. And I know that Senator Housley is probably very happy about that. But I just want you all to know that we will reschedule our discussion about artificial intelligence. So we hope that when we do reschedule that, that uh, you will get the invite and come and sit in with us because we think it's an important discussion. So thank you so much, Job Committee. Uh, we will meet another day. Thank you so kindly. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Tuesday, April 9th at 11 a.m. On that motion, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned until when? When? It's not on here. When? Uh, Tuesday, April 9th at 11 a.m.